wait, I own these games? Oh, hello! Welcome to Citanium Mine. Uh, just looking through a game collection I didn't even know that I had. Uh, I don't know if anyone else experiences that, where you realize that you had some kind of a game account and uh, you never look at it, but you had a bunch of free games that you could claim for some kind of promotional deal. And then one day you look at it and go, Oh, I guess I own these. Maybe I should play them? Well, recently that happened to me because, turns out, even though I keep forgetting about it, I have an Amazon Games account, and periodically they let me claim uh, some games that they have on there. A lot of them are old classic SNK, you know, shooter kind of games, but there are a smattering of other titles that get, uh, you know, wedged in there once in a while, and so... I tried some of them, and thought I would talk about them here. So, on this episode, we are going to be talking about Cardboard Kings, Grime, and Abandoned Ship. Cardboard Kings Card Game Island is a title that is going to be a little reminiscent of Moonlighter, I suppose, or really any other game where you're running a shop. It's supposed to be sort of a cozy game, but also sort of one of those trading sim sort of uh, titles. Uh, it doesn't really have so much in the action element piece, but it, it's definitely moving towards the idea of uh, owning a shop and running it. The conceit of the game is that there's this popular card game called Warlock, and you own a shop that sells these Warlock cards. You have valuation on them, and the valuation of the different cards fluctuates, and there can be holographic cards, there can be different cards of different rarities, they have some stats on them for... Uh, what kind of attribute they have, either it's like strength, or I guess I should say it's brawn, brains, or beauty, and a power level. And at first, you don't really understand what any of that has to do with selling the cards, because they seem to have arbitrary valuation that doesn't necessarily reflect those attributes. You do find out about it a little bit later. In the meantime, though, you're set up with the idea that you want to buy cards when they are low in market value and try to sell them when they become more popular. You get all of these pop-ups while you're playing from the news that basically says, hey, so-and-so says this is their favorite set from Warlock or uh, the, uh, the, the Church of cardatology or whatever uh is is saying that green cards are demonic so their value is going to go up in the next two days or so and so trying to figure out when your cards are going to actually be more valuable or less valuable is very indicative to see what kind of profit margin you're going to make there is a storyline that is uh kind of silly. It's about a corporation that's, uh, you know, trying to do mean corporate things and messing with the shop owner, uh, trying to get him to sell out of the store or something. And then it kind of resolves itself at a certain point by having a world-ending battle that you're not part of. Don't worry too much about it. It's not really important at all. Uh, but it does segue into the continuation of the game where you will periodically be able to go to uh, this card battling island where you can actually take a deck of cards that has been pre-constructed for you with one of the characters from the game that's not the shop owner. And you can battle with other characters that you've met throughout the storyline. And this is actually where the attributes and the power levels come into play, because obviously higher power levels beat other power levels, but there's a rock-paper-scissors-ishness to the brain's beauty and brawn uh, aspect. Uh, so the idea is that these, these are the two big factors that determine whether you end up with a draw or a success or failure when one card attacks another card. And you do have a little bit of strategy you can use because different colors of cards... Um, that are out in your frontline defense 
can be augmented in one way or another, either by changing their attribute or increasing their power from the secondary support cards that also share their color. So it's actually a pretty easy idea and concept. The thing that did annoy me, though, is uh, I don't know how to modify my deck at the beginning. And I would have really liked to be able to construct that. But either it skips over it so fast that I didn't even notice it or didn't even talk about it, uh, or it's just not possible uh, at all. But I, I just kept ending up with this same deck made for me, uh, which in very similar fashion to like Slay the Spire, uh, will then get modified, upgraded, or you'll add cards to it over the course of the run. You have a little bit of a battle system. It, it is very similar to that game, actually. Uh, not necessarily as good or fleshed out as Slay the Spire. Trust me on that. But by that point in the game, it is good to have a little bit of a change of pace. But the main mechanic is really buying and selling and uh, owning your shop. Now. It's fine. Uh, the pixel graphics are serviceable, but I was really interested in the fact that the cards themselves and the characters themselves are like hand-drawn art style cards. And when they introduce new sets into the game, they all have unique art styles, which was also really interesting to see. They, they did a very good job with the card design and... Um, how each set has its own specific look and feel to it and art style. So that was really cool. I would say, though, if you're looking for, like, great trading game sims, it's probably not uh, real high up there. Uh, if you're looking for another one that I thought was kind of fun in a, in a really disturbing way, uh, I would suggest looking for... I had to look it up. Uh, Space Warlord Organ Trading Simulator, which is a, a real game, uh, which is where you're trying to buy and sell organs at a market against a bunch of other aliens and then sell them on the black market to other people. It's um, very tongue-in-cheek uh, and, and very dark. But, <laughs> but uh, as far as a, a pure trading simulator goes, uh, I think is maybe a little bit more interesting. Uh, might not be for everybody. Uh, Cardboard Kings, though, is serviceable enough as it stands. Grime, Colors of Rot. Terrible subtitle, but an interesting take on more of the Souls-like formula, but in a two-dimensional, more classic Metroidvania style of gameplay. The concept of Grime is that you're some kind of a stone creature, and you have to battle other stone creatures. It, it, that's pretty much it. There's a few basic stats that you upgrade throughout the game. Uh, you have health, and you have focus, I believe it's called, which is similar to stamina. It's the um, you know meter that tells you when you can do actions that regenerates. Different weapons are also part of three different kinds of attributes that determine their effectiveness and the damage that they deal. Some that actually have requirements to have one of those other three stats. It's pretty straightforward in terms of its presentation. The way that it's all built is pretty nice. There is a bit of an interconnected world where there are certain doors you can't get through or walls you can't break through from one side, but you can from the other. You know the formula. It's... Uh, it, it, you've seen it before. If you played any Souls-like, you know exactly how this runs. Uh, but they do have a couple interesting little maneuvers. Like, instead of just countering enemy attacks, you can absorb them, which will essentially replenish what is their version of an Estus Flask in this game, but will also seriously damage them immediately after you have done that. And as you absorb more of a specific enemy type, you unlock the ability to get aspects of those monsters and can even put in some specialized points that will be used 
uh, based on aspects of the monsters that you fought, whether they be the, the hands coming down or the little crawly dudes that don't do very much. Uh, you can end up with some aspects, new maneuvers, and uh, even some uh, benefits to your damage mitigation by taking on certain aspects of those. Also, sets of armor will give you similar benefits depending on what you take. At first, I thought it was going to be much more forgiving than a Dark Souls, and it is, granted. But the reason that I thought that was because I didn't lose my currency when I died and got sent back to essentially the bonfire in the game. It turns out that you actually do lose something. Um, there is this meter that expands as you defeat different enemies, and it, it makes you more potent in combat as you go forward. Similar, I guess, to like what they did with Wolong, but to be honest with you, I, I never really understood why it had any valuation at all. Uh, you know, it if you get it up to 48, I didn't find myself particularly more effective than when it was at zero. I didn't really track it or determine if it meant much to me in the long run, so kind of a useless mechanic. Uh, I was just kind of happy that I didn't lose any of the currency that you actually buy stuff with, including your own upgrades. And so it, it is actually a, a little easier in that regard. You can always recover your power-up ability if you go and, you know, recover your old body after you died, but I, I didn't see much motivation to do it. That's not necessarily a bad thing either, because it just encourages you to say, eh, I didn't want to go that way, maybe I'll try going off in this direction and see other areas of the map. What is really interesting about Grime is that there's this section of the game that you can start out in, and you beat the first boss there. It's not too difficult once you get the basic mechanics down. Um, but after you defeat that one greater threat, greater prey that you have, it reveals what the entire game is. It, it, it reveals much more of the amount of space you have. And for a while, you would think that this area that you're in is pretty well spaced, you know, it, it seems like a, a pretty good size area, and you'd be looking forward to playing in a few more of them. When it actually expands out and shows you the map marker that you now need to get to, and it's like way over here, and the part of the map that you've been on is like way, 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 way down here in the corner, you get an impression of the scope that the game is trying to go for. Whether it actually warrants that or not is hard to tell. I haven't completed the game, but I have been able to see a few of the different biomes, and, you know, I, I think it has enough interesting stuff to it that if you're a fan of Souls-likes, you might want to pick it up, but even if you're not so big on Souls-likes, I, I would say that it has uh, less punishment that it does to the player than similar games in its genre. I would tell you about some of the other Souls-likes that are worth playing for a person who's not a fan of Dark Souls, but I think we're going to do that in a whole different video down the road, so just wait on that. In the meantime, though, Grime is a neat a little game with an interesting art style and a look and a feel. I think it is held back a little bit because it could have used a little bit more refinement in the gameplay department to tighten it up a little bit for controls, but at least it's not the tank controls that you're used to from that darn Dark Souls series. So, good for letting them do that. I would like to be able to directionally throw my spikes that you keep giving me, though, instead of just throwing them in a arc straight out. That would have been great would help me hit the enemies that are firing at me from a distance. Stuff like that. Stuff, stuff like that that starts to get annoying after a little while. Not a bad time, though. Abandoned Ship is a game that tries to look like the old naval paintings of yore, but 
in order to create these ship-to-ship battles where you are fighting against this cult that is coming after you and your crew. The general concept of the game is really neat. You're going around these larger map sections and then getting into random encounters where you will have to fight these other ships and try to uh, shoot at different areas of their ships, uh, beat their crew, and sink their battleship before they sink yours. And there are even upgrades so that you can get new ships, so that you can uh, hire new crew, uh, get upgrades, etc. with some of the currency that you get from all these ship-to-ship battles. There are even some neat mechanics where you can get hull damage and then somebody has to go and repair it, and you can send one of your crew over to repair those. If your crew gets hurt, there's a med station and they might have to break away from their cannons in order to go and heal themselves. Uh, There are bilge pumps, so if you start taking on water, you need to send people over there to get the water out of the boat. And so it is sort of more a strategy micromanagement game where you're trying to put your crew onto the most important missions that they need to be on while they are under attack and the other crew is trying to do the exact same thing. There are even sections where you have to deal with monsters because it is that sort of game and one of the most jarring ones is where a kraken literally appears. And when the Kraken shows up, you only have the option basically to try and fight it off long enough to run away. Now I imagine that if I kept playing the game, eventually it would tell me that I can defeat the Kraken. But frankly, I realize that there are some serious issues with this title. One is that the gameplay really does boil down to just those ship-to-ship combats, and it's not fast. It's really not quick. Uh, it, it, it takes an inordinate amount of time for your cannons to reload, for your chain shots to reload, anything, anything at all. And somebody has to be manning it for that entire time. There's a long period where nobody is doing anything but waiting for reloads. And so that becomes kind of boring. I would say that it might be necessary from a strategic element if you're talking about real-time strategy, but at any time, you can actually pause the game and assign people to where you want them. So, So that waiting period is completely extraneous. And then the problem with upgrading and then maintaining your ship. When I finally got to a port, and I could choose some upgrades and stuff, I thought, oh, great, I'll be able to come back here on a regular occasion, and I'll be able to, you know, upgrade as I go and explore a little bit before I move on to the next section of the map. Problem with that, after I left the port, it gets taken over by the cultists that are still following me. They're constantly pursuing you. And because of that, I can't use that port anymore. There are no other ports. There's no other way for me to repair my ship. My ship is now at half health. I have no way of really repairing my ship. And I am now under threat of the cultists coming to destroy me. And they'll have ships at full health. Even though I'm literally not doing anything at the moment, I can't assign my crew to repair the ship. I should say that maybe there is a way to do it in the game, but it is not made clear how. I can do it at port, but I can't get to the port now. They won't let me dock there again. The cultists are there. So where am I supposed to go? I'm just supposed to be at half health. And then, when I encounter the next ship, they're obviously going to overpower me because I don't have the resources available. I have also seen members of my crew fall in combat, and then they'll be okay afterward as long as you stabilize them, but they now have status conditions, and I'd like to be able to get those status conditions off, or fully heal them, or do some kind of upgrades, but again, there isn't really a port or any other place for me to do that and I need to complete a number of quests before I can move on to the next section of map where I might be able to do that. So you kind of get locked into this place where I don't have enough health to deal with any of the other skirmishes, 
but I need to get into skirmishes so I can get to the next area of the map so that I can repair the ship. So what am I supposed to do? Die. That's pretty much it. I'm supposed to die. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And, um, and so it's not the best experience. I like the concept, but I was kind of hoping that it would be more of like a naval seafaring game, like maybe King of Seas or something like that. And, and it's, it's not, it's a, it's a tactical game and it is trying something new by having that ship to ship combat where you can ram enemies, uh, or maybe you can set their boats on fire or, uh, you know, destroy their sails but doesn't really fully flesh it out to a way that's practical for most people who are going to be playing it. And so I can't really recommend it. Uh, if I were to say I could rank these three games in terms of best to worst, uh, Abandoned Ship is probably uh, the at the bottom, and I would say that uh, Cardboard Kings is probably the one that kept my attention the longest, so I'd say Cardboard Kings is probably the most recommendable. Grime is okay, and Abandon Ship, I'm going to abandon. They're not necessarily, like, bad games. I appreciate the effort, and I definitely felt like they were interesting, unique experiences that I was glad I just so happened to have for free uh, on a, <laughs> on a game... Uh, account that I didn't even remember that I had, but I didn't necessarily think that they were not missable. Like you could, you could go your entire life not playing these games and not necessarily feel robbed of the experience. Uh, but if you do get a chance to try them out, I would encourage people to. Because I think that they add a little something into the genres and might be worth at least spending a little bit of time with them to see what you think of them. I also downloaded Terraformers and I haven't played that one yet on this account. And apparently I have Calico. I played that on another system and I didn't care for it, to be honest with you. I guess the takeaway that I would have to summarize this episode up is sometimes. Uh, gamers will end up with accounts that they might not have even remembered that they have. And with all of the promotions that different companies will do where you'll get free games, you might forget that you even own them. Uh, that's definitely happened to me once or twice where I was like, oh, this looks like an interesting game. Wait, I already own it on something? I didn't know that. Uh, but it might be worth your time to look and see if one of these other game accounts that might have been shuffled to the back is worth looking at again, and that there might be some hidden gems on there. In fact, if you want to try and look up your accounts, you can do so while you're here. Uh, you don't have to leave. I'm just going to go check on it right over here uh, to see what else is on my game account. Let's just see here what I got. Uh, Psychotics Agatha Knife. Uh, okay. Tandem, A Tale of Shadows. Uh, what is it? Shattered, Tale of the Forgotten King. I have no idea what these are. Beholder 2. Ooh, that looks spooky. Ninja Masters. Star Wars Rogue Squadron 3D. Oh, yeah, no, I'd love to play that, but I don't think my computer can even do it anymore. Um, Lake? Oh, I did start playing Lake. I didn't even know I... Now I own it? Apparently I own that one now. Wait, where'd you go? Of course, you took off again. Typical. Typical.